Hello, YouTubers. Joe Kersey here on uh, December 20th, 2016, at 14.50 in the Eastern Time, afternoon, Eastern Time. A little beverage here with you. Today's backdrop is a lake freighter going down the St. Mary's River just south of Sault Ste. Marie, going through the Nebish Island Cut to get down into Lake Huron proper. Um, I mean, it's in Lake Huron, but to get down into where it's the actual big lake without being congested and constricted. That's Nebish Island on the far side. We were staying at a town called Barbeau, uh, right on the tip of uh, the Upper Peninsula, the eastern tip of the Upper Peninsula, but, but sort of about halfway between Sault Ste. Marie and then uh, down to the southern shore of the Upper Peninsula. We were staying in a very, uh, it was like one of these four or five unit motel type things. Uh, a couple of, couple of guys uh, ran this thing. Uh, it's since not there anymore, or been discontinued, or they sold it. Uh, but uh, you know, they didn't mind if you brought your dogs, and uh, yeah, it was a really nice place. Had a good time there. We went. We went there probably about uh, six years, not not consecutively, but uh, six years, say over a nine-year period. This was probably in '99 or. 2000 that I took this. I want to thank uh, one of my subscribers, uh, It's All Gravy, for uh, watching, watching and commenting uh, so regularly on my videos. And I also want to thank a new subscriber, Adam Sobolewski, Sobolewski, or Sobolewski. It's a Polish name, and I'm sorry, I can't pronounce that properly, I'm sure. Adam Sobolewski, I thank you for subscribing, too. Um, wrist is getting better. I was actually able to take a shower today. Uh, that falls in the category of too much information, as one of my subscribers said. <laughs> um, I was able to get down to the mailbox twice today. Uh, by the late afternoon, by just about oh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, early afternoon, mid-afternoon, uh, the ice in the driveway had melted. Well, most of it. So I uh, was able to get down there without feeling like I was about ready to die. Let's bear in mind that after heart disease and cancer and stuff like that, falls, <laughs> falls are the thing that do in people most over the age of 50. So you think you're 50 and you're fit, you're at risk, dudes. Okay, well, today I want to tell you a story. I told you I was going to tell you a story, yesterday anyway. Today I want to talk about ether. As you know, I practice anesthesia. But one of the big regrets that I always had as an anesthesiologist was that I was never able to do an actual ether anesthetic. Ether in many ways is the ideal anesthetic agent, except it burns. Note I say burns, not explode. No. Its vapor is denser than air, it sinks to the bottom of the room. If there's a spark that ignites it, it will burn in this little sort of, it's like a, like a little, little blue flame that is down on the floor of the operating room. But it doesn't blow up. 
cyclopropane blows up, or did, I don't use it anymore either, but ether would burn, and because of that, uh, they basically just essentially outlawed it. Well, they didn't outlaw it. What they, what they did was they, the, the government said you had to post signs saying, you know, no, vol no flammable anesthetics allowed to be used in this room. And then even with the ban on flammable anesthetics being used in the operating room, you had to wear these, these boots with, with a grounding strip in them. You know, you had to wear them over your shoes and you had to stick the grounding strip down into your foot so that the moisture from your sock would, you know, you'd get a ground. If you think about it, if you think about it, the last thing in the world you want is somebody touching you that is grounded in the operating room with all the electrical stuff going on. Because if the guy touching you is grounded, the current's going to pass through your body into the floor and kill you. Nonetheless, they didn't want any sparks or static igniting the ether. Long after ether was discontinued in use. You know, 30 years, it took over 30 years after ether was stopped, discontinued in being in use in hospitals in the United States to eliminate that requirement to have those signs and these grounding strips on your shoes. Welcome to the government helping us, huh? In any case, I witnessed, although I was not privileged to take part in, the last ether anesthetic given at Ohio State University when I was in training. It was given by the most senior anger anesthesia resident at the time named uh, Dave, well I can probably tell you his name because he's a good guy, Dave Martino. Dave was a very interesting guy. He had done three years of neurosurgery residency uh, before he went into anesthesia, before he shifted over to anesthesiology. Um, so as such, I mean he was far more knowledgeable about a lot of stuff than anybody else in the program. I was always full of all sorts of little insights and tips. Uh, he still carried a rainy drill in his coat pocket when he walked around in the hospital or his pants pocket even, uh, such that if he came upon somebody with a subdural or somebody that needed a burr hole, he could do a burr hole right there on the spot. Uh, yeah, that's, that's great. That's a good idea. I mean, they're, they're not very big. You know, all you got to do is you, know, you have to have a handle. But he carried the bit with him around at all times. He, uh... See, the thing about ether got a bad rep, not only because it burns, but uh, because people would, would have had open drop ether as a kid for tonsils or something like that. And they woke up and they puked. You know, you know. Oh, I had ether. I puked. Oh, I don't want ether. The thing about ether is, you know, you puke when you swallow it. If you don't use it through an endotracheal tube, you, when you wake up, you swallow it. Or when you you get it by open drop, you swallow it. Ether in the stomach is very, you know, tremendous gastric irritant. So of course they threw up. Until they threw up all the ether they had swallowed. I had open drop ether for my tonsils when I was five. Um, it was not a particularly pleasant experience. Um, I, I would never make a good hut head, let's put it that way. As much as I like to smell the mimeograph paper that just came out of the mimeograph machines when I was in school, you know. Uh, as a kid, you know, I would never make a dedicated huff head. Uh, uh, I don't recall throwing up, though, uh, when, I, uh, as, when I awakened. Uh, I remember being a bit disoriented for about 20 minutes. 
and then, you know, was taken back to my room. It was at Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, and at that time they, they admitted you the night before and they kept you one night afterwards. Uh, nowadays they don't do that at all. Uh, that's another that's another diatribe at some point. Well anyway, uh, if you give ether through an endotracheal tube, uh, it it is probably the absolute ideal anesthetic agent. Uh, it maintains respiration and, and blood pressure all the way down to very deep levels of inhaled anesthesia. Uh, if you get to the point where your blood pressure goes down, in fact, the blood pressure drops before you stop breathing. It, it's an, in, an intense muscle relaxant in its own right. In other words, oxygen and ether are all you would really need to do anesthesia if that's all you had. Uh, the thing about ether though is it takes, it's, it's very soluble so it takes a long time to put you down and it takes you a long time to wake up. So, in that sense it's less than ideal. Uh, it's, it's not all that potent takes somewhere between 16 and 30 percent to, to maintain anesthesia. But if you give it out of a thing, we had a thing called a copper kettle, which is a, a copper kettle that you bubble oxygen through, you, you fill it, you put ether in it, you bubble oxygen through the ether, the oxygen picks up a certain amount of the ether, then you put it into the circuit, and then the patient breathes that, and it's, that's how you do it. They say, actually, you maintain them at about 5% when you finally got them to sleep. Uh, but you had to run higher concentrations because you wanted to get them to sleep faster, you know, because it's very soluble. All that stuff's going into the blood. It's not going into the brain at that point. That's called uptake and distribution. Uh, I think the, the book to read on that is by a guy named Eager. He was out of San Francisco. I don't know if he's still alive yet or not. <coughs> I met him a few times. <coughs> me. Anyway, so basically everybody in the anesthesia department is packed, you know, outside the operating room doors, looking through the window, in the scrub rooms, looking through the window. <coughs> Maybe standing inside, you know, watching Dave do this anesthetic. And uh, I think Dr. Hamelberg, who was the chairman then, uh, uh, who was my chairman when I was there, <coughs> uh, was staffing him, but essentially Dave was doing the whole thing. And, uh, you know, he used the last can of either. <laughs> the last can of ether at the University Hospital to, to do this, uh, to put in the copper kettle. And I thought, gosh, I sure wish I could have been doing that. <laughs> Excuse me. Don't inhale beer, guys. Most certainly don't inhale wine. Uh, what I did get to use once, uh, and this was up on uh, the labor and delivery floor for postpartum uh, tubal ligation after uh, somebody had delivered, I did get to use cyclopropane because they were still using cyclopropane up there on the labor and delivery floor for uh, uh, well. Typically, they use it for postpartum BPSs. You know. Essentially, you take three breaths of cyclopropane at 16%, you know, 15%. And actually, that's what 16% was maintenance on that. And I mean, they go right to sleep. I mean, you just, it's a mass conduction. They're asleep. It's relatively odorless. It's not at all unpleasant, apparently, uh, to have this done. Um, I got to do a couple of those. Uh, uh, 
and it's you know it's a, it's an impressive drug. When uh, when I started as a medical student, they were still using cyclopropane uh, in the heart rooms for uh, aortic valve cases <clears throat> because it slows the heart rate, it maintains the blood pressure. It's a very intense vasoconstrictor, and for aortic stenosis case. And, and those valves that you did in the, in the early mid 70s, the valve patients were all very, 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 very sick because they'd, they'd wait till they got really, really sick before they did them because the fatality rates on valves were relatively high at that point. <clears throat> so, uh, a lot of the older guys really like to use cyclopropane for their aortic valve cases. But cyclopropane explodes. In fact, uh, I didn't hear this happen, but I was told about it by somebody who did hear it happen. Uh, they were doing a thoracotomy with cyclopropane, and uh, it exploded. In, it exploded in the patient. Exploded in the patient's lung. Exploded the guy's lung. So that's, that's one you did want to be careful with about electrically sensitive situations. Stories, huh? Well, I finished Tony Salmon last night. It was very good. A bit dry, but very good, as salmon is, at least as far as I'm concerned. So I'm going to say... Enjoy your trip down the St. Mary's River on the Lake Freighter, and bye-bye YouTube.